When I first uh, became aware of Amendment 4, probably a few months ago, several months back, I, I recognized right away that this was an issue that we as a church, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, this is something that we cannot ignore. And here's where I'm at on it. I, I cannot imagine waking up on Tuesday, November 5th on Election Day here in the state of Florida. It's only four weeks away from this Tuesday. I cannot imagine waking up on that day and realizing that I have said or done nothing about an evil amendment that's on our ballot in our state where we are citizens that would legalize the killing, the murder of unborn children all the way up to the point of birth. It's something that we need to stand up for. I, I was looking at some numbers and some different statistics on it. Um, under Roe v. Wade, it's estimated that as many as 80,000 babies were aborted every single year in the state of Florida alone. Now, just imagine being at a football game at a stadium that is packed full of people. Um, I think Florida State Stadium, for instance, holds right at 80,000 people. Imagine a sellout crowd, every single person in there, and then every single one of those people is just wiped out and gone. That's what abortion does every single year in the state of Florida alone, and it's been estimated that there's been as many as 64 million babies that have been murdered since it became legalized in the United States alone. It is an evil amendment, and it's something that I believe that we as believers and as God's children, we need to understand what the Bible says, and we need to stand up, and we need to promote, and we need to protect life. I believe that Jesus clearly drew the battle lines for us on this. Look at John 10, 10. Go ahead and put it up on the screen. I want you all to help me with this. I want you to read the first part of John chapter 10, verse 10 with me this morning. I think they're looking for it. There it is. Okay. All right, everybody, help me out with the first part of this. What's it say? Here we go. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. The thief is Satan. And what does Satan want to do? Satan wants to steal, he wants to kill, and he wants to destroy. And, and in a simple way, that's exactly what abortion is. Abortion steals, kills, and destroys. And as we go through this message, as we look into God's word today, we're going to talk about some of the profound spiritual, emotional, and physical effects that abortion has, not just in the fact that it destroys and kills that life before it ever even has a chance to, to breathe a breath in this world, but also the spiritual, emotional, and physical effects that it has on the mothers and the fathers that are involved in something like abortion. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to steal, he wants to kill, and destroy. But put that verse back up there and look at the end of it. Here's the other side, the complete opposite. What's it say at the end? It says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. We serve a God in heaven who loves us. And he's passionate about life and he created us and he created us in his image and in his likeness and he created us to bless us and he created us for a relationship with him and for fellowship with him and for eternal life and he's passionate about life and he wants us to be blessed and he wants us to be prosperous and he wants us to enjoy the life and the fellowship and the relationship that comes with knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and as followers of Jesus we must be passionate about life. We must be passionate about preserving it, defending it, protecting it, promoting it. That's what we as believers do. And so the title of my message this morning is this. It's life is sacred. Life is sacred. If you believe in the sanctity of life, you believe that life is holy or sacred. You believe that life is worthy of respect and it's worthy of great reverence. How many of you believe that life is sacred? Do you believe that it's holy? Do you believe that it's worthy of reverence and great respect? That's what sanctity of life is all about, and that's what we're going to find in the Bible. This morning, we're going to see clearly from God's word that life begins in the womb. If we're going to be passionate about life, I like this phrase. It's an easy thing to remember. But as believers, we should be passionate about life from the womb to the tomb. And I believe with all of my heart that that life begins at the moment of conception. It begins in the womb. And here's the reality. We all know it. We know it deep down inside. Just like we know that there is a God in heaven who created this world, we know that that child that is inside the womb is a real life. And I'm going to play a video right now that just starts a story, and we're going to come back and finish it later. But go ahead and play it, and you'll see this clearly.
relationship would be with her boyfriend, how he would respond. And she thought, I can't tell him that I'm having a baby. He thought I was on birth control. And so she said, I'm going to have an abortion. She'd heard about the abortion pill. She'd seen ads about it. So she called up to the closest abortion clinic, which was up in Tallahassee, just north of her. She gets on the phone. She goes, look, I've looked at my calendar. I am nine weeks pregnant. I want to get the abortion pill. And they said, um, we can't get you in. There's no way we can't get you in until two weeks because we are just jam-packed full. And she goes, that'll be too late. I'll be 11 weeks and I've got to get this done before I'm 10 weeks. So they said, well, you can maybe go to Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville is like four hours away. So she calls Jacksonville and says, hey, can I get in today? And they said, we've got an opening. Come on in. We'd be happy to get you in. So she gets in her car and she starts heading east on Interstate 10. She drives all the way to Jacksonville. She gets to the abortion clinic and she's been thinking the whole way, you know, am I doing the right thing? She gets to the clinic. She is kind of given a hard sell on, oh, it's real easy. You just take this pill and it takes care of everything. So she signs a consent form. She then swipes her credit card, gets the pill, is told about four more pills to take the next day. She swallows the pill, thinks everything is done, everything's back to normal, and she goes out to her car. She starts her car, and she gets back on the interstate, and she's driving on I-10. And of course, she's thinking, well, what's been going on? What's going on with my life? What did I just do? But she's like, no, nope, this is the right decision. I've thought this through, and this is the right thing. And then she's driving along the interstate. She's thinking about the relationship. Do I even tell him that I was pregnant and that I took the abortion pill? And while she's thinking all these things through, she sees a billboard over on the right side. Somebody was touched by the Holy Spirit. They put up this billboard. And we all have seen these billboards and thought, why did somebody put that up? She saw that billboard. She read that billboard. And the billboard said, heartbeat at 18 days. It touched her. She thought, 18 days, I'm already nine weeks. She goes, this baby has a heartbeat. And she said, nope, nope, you thought this through. Um, you did the right thing. You took the abortion pill. Everything's going to be okay. And she keeps on driving, but this is still going through her mind. Holy Spirit touched another person. They put up a different billboard on the other side of the road. And she looks at that billboard, and that billboard said, your mom chose life. You should too. She paused, and she thought, oh, my goodness. What have I done? What have I done? That's a powerful question right there. And I believe the Bible gives the answers to the gravity of that question. It answers the, question, the gravity of that question. So that's what we're going to look at this morning in Psalm chapter 139. Look at verse 13 with me. i got a couple things I'm just going to walk us through. First thing I want us to see this morning is this. Life is intentional. Life is intentional. Look at verse 13. It says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. That, that first phrase, thou hast possessed my reins. He brought into existence. That's what that word possessed means. He brought into existence my reins, my kidneys, my most inward being, my in internal organs. God brought that into beginning and into existence. And then it says that he has covered me in my mother's womb. Literally, he knit me together. Inside my mother's womb. Life is intentional. God is personally involved in the creation of life. There is care, there is intentionality, and there is purpose in the formation of every single person. The Bible tells us that here in Psalm 139. I believe that this begins inside the womb at the moment of conception. At the moment of conception. You know what conception is? Conception is when one cell from the mother and one cell from the Father, they join together and they form new life. You want to know that it's really cool? You can go home and you can research this. You can find videos on this. But researchers, as, uh, as recently as like 2011, researchers at Northwestern University, people that don't even believe in God or know God, they were able to put this moment underneath a microscope. And when that cell from the mother joins with that cell from the Father, at the moment of conception, guess what happens? There is an explosion of light. It mirrors what happened at the creation of the world. And those researchers have even identified at that moment when, those, when, those, when that explosion takes place that that's the beginning of life. And that happens inside the womb. That happens long before they are given birth and they breathe their very first breath. And so you see that, that, that when conception happens, it is a genetically unique, uh, it, is, it is a genuinely unique person that is different from mom and dad. And um, it was created, that child was created with care, intentionality, and purpose. 
What kind of care? What kind of intentionality? What kind of purpose? You go back to Genesis chapter 1. If you just were going to start reading in the beginning of the Bible and you pick it up and you open it up and you go to Genesis chapter 1, you're not going to get very far into it where you're going to go through the creation account. And then the first thing that you find out about man is that we are created in the image and likeness of God. What makes man and, and what makes mankind unique from all other life forms is that we're created in the image and likeness of God. We are given a soul. We are able to have a relationship with God. And through our lives, we're able to reflect his glory. That right off the bat is something that is unbelievable and something that is different and something that is unique about all of mankind. We are created in the image of God. And then if you read a little bit further, you go to Genesis chapter 2 and you get to verse 7. And you know what the Bible says? And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Everything else, all the other creation, he spoke it into existence. But when it came to mankind, he reaches his hands down into the earth. He scoops up some dirt and he forms mankind with his hands. And then it says this, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The creator of the universe universe stooped down from heaven and intimately breathed into our nostrils the very breath of life. His creation was hands-on. It's personal. It's intentional. And I'm telling you, there is great care and intentionality and purpose that goes into every single human being. And that begins inside the womb at the moment of creation. Can I tell you this morning that abortion is spiritual. Abortion is a spiritual battle that has taken place. Ultimately, it's not a battle that's being fought against people. And let me just say that over and over again. Abortion is not a battle that is being fought against people. I love what Ephesians chapter 6 says. It says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I think we need to remember that our enemy is not one another. There is a force that is at work behind every single thing and evil that is happening in this world. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That is who the fight is against. And abortion is spiritual warfare at its core. You already heard Dr. Lyle say it. It is hatred of God, and it is an all-out attempt to destroy his image. Satan can never destroy God. So what's the next best thing he can do? He can attack his image bearers. He can attack people. And I believe that is the heart of what lies behind what is happening with abortion. And abortion is spiritual warfare, and it is evil. I believe that it's murder, plain and simple. I don't believe that it is a deeply complex and nuanced issue. It is the taking of an unborn life that was created with intention and care and purpose and intentionality by God. So life is intentional. But not only that, life is awesome. Look at what it says in verse 14. He says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right. Well, I just want to say, I want to insert something. This wasn't in my notes. When I go over that and I see that, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and even going back to the point that this fight is not against people, my heart genuinely breaks for people that have been deceived by the lies that Satan puts into this culture and into our world. And you know what? The fact that, that we just came from nothing and we just happened to be here, it, it robs us of the purpose and the value that we have in God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are not mistakes. We are not accidents. There wasn't just a bunch of particles that exploded one day and all of a sudden, bam, we are here. We have a creator in heaven who loves us. And you know what our world needs to hear today? They need to hear that they're not a mistake, that they are formed by God and that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Hey, if your heart breaks for the next generation, that's a message that needs to get into their hearts and minds and into their souls. God loves you, and you have a purpose, and you're not a mistake, and you're not an accident, and he has the answers that you're looking for in life. Life is awesome. Man, when we're talking about being fearfully and wonderfully made, we're not accidental. We are a work of divine craftsmanship that is worthy of awe and reverence and fear. Man, that just, all of this made me think back to my children and when they were born. And especially with Stuart, our very first child, I remember every single thing about it. By the way, the whole process is phenomenal. Pregnancy is awesome, right, ladies? <laughs> I'll tell you, I can promise you this. In our house, there was great reverence and fear when the pregnancies were going on. I can promise you that. But man, you think about that process, it really is phenomenal. 
what's happening inside of a, a, a woman's body and how the bond is being formed between the child and the mother long before that, that baby is ever born. And then the entire birth process. You want to talk about something that's really awesome. Birth is awesome. I love that. How many of you ladies say amen to that too? You're all like, sit this man down. He doesn't need to be the one talking. But I promise you that when all of my kids were born, I did way too much talking. I mean, I remember when Atlanta was having the epidural, I was like, holy cow, that needle is long. And she's like, shut up, <laughs> you know. And then I'll never forget when that moment came and Stuart finally arrived. I mean, it was after a long delivery and I'm just, I'll just be very quick about it, but it was an amazing process, all right? It was absolutely phenomenal. And all of a sudden, my son is here. He's arrived into this world and I'm seeing him. And the very first thing out of my mouth was, he looks like an alien. <laughs> And the doctor, again, is like, be quiet. I mean, he had a cone head. I'll tell you what, I love that little alien. I loved him right away. I didn't know I could love an alien so much, but man, my heart was like wrapped around that, that boy. And it was amazing. Just a little bit later, that head like came back down and it was a perfectly shaped and formed head. And all I'm saying is the entire process is phenomenal. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, y'all are like this guy. Pray for Atlanta, okay? She, she needs a lot of it. Oh, and then I'll never forget when we came home from the hospital, we put him in that car seat. I've never been one that's like a, a very slow driver, okay? I'm kind of a, but man, he's six pounds. He was a tiny little guy. We put him in that car seat and I'll never forget. I've never driven so slow and carefully in my entire life. I mean, every single turn, because I'm just like, he's fragile. That's what he seemed like to me. The nurses are just like flopping him around like he's nothing, and I'm like, no, that's my child. You all understand what we're saying? If you've experienced that, you understand life and how awesome it really truly is. Stuart, Shepard, Sabin, Scarlet, every single person that's here, every single person that's created inside the womb, they are not accidental. They are a work of divine craftsmanship, worthy of awe and reverence and fear. Can I tell you that? Not only is abortion a spiritual issue, abortion is also an emotional issue. Abortion is emotional in the same way that atheism is emotional. I believe this with all my heart. An, an atheist, they know deep down inside that there is a God. Romans 1 tells us that we are all created with that knowledge of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. We look at this creation and we say there's, there's got to be a God. There's got to be somebody who brought all of this into existence. It's the only thing that makes sense. Atheism is not an intellectual or an enlightened position. It is a foolish and emotional response against the truth of God that we know in our hearts. It's deliberate. I, I, what I think is really great is that we can see very clearly that the works of God are wonderful, even if we can understand nothing else about them. You may not understand everything that happens inside the womb or that happens in the form of creation, but we can see the wonderful works of God, even if we don't understand further. It is plain and it is evident. And the same thing is true when it comes to abortion. Choosing to abort a baby is not nothing. Choosing to abort a baby is not nothing. It's not like taking your appendix out or your gallbladder out or removing a cyst or a tumor. It's not that. It's taking of life. Abortion is going to cause deep emotional stress and baggage. And we saw that in that mother. That mother was having that internal struggle all the way driving to Jacksonville. Then when it's done, it would not go away. And God did use those billboards to speak to her heart and to speak the truth into what she already knew inside of her. Abortion will cause deep emotional stress and baggage because life is awesome and it begins inside the womb. And then I also think in this passage, not only is life intentional, not only is life awesome, but life is seen. Look at verse 15. He says, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. God's still speaking here about the preborn. Okay, this is all inside the womb. And he says, from the very beginning of development, even before development, life is known, life is valued, life is seen by God. We are seen and known by God. Hey, by the way, if you have time this afternoon, read all of Psalm 139. That's what it's all about. He starts in Psalm 139, and, and he says that God knows when we sit down and when we stand up. He's acquainted with all of our ways. 
Um, he, he knows what we're going to speak before we even speak it. If we try to get away from him, if we try to turn around and run away from God, guess what? He's there. And if we turn around and we try to go this way away from God, guess what? He's there. We are encompassed around. We're surrounded by him everywhere we go. And, and then David gets to the point and he says, where can I go from his presence? If I ascend up into heaven, he's there. If I make my bed in Sheol, in the underworld, guess what? He's there. If I go into the lowest parts of the sea, thy right hand is there, and you're guiding me, and you're still with me. I can't go to the darkness. If I'm in darkness, it's still in light. You can see me perfectly clearly. There is absolutely no escaping God. And then he takes it right from there all the way to the womb. That's what verses 13 and 16, they're all about the preborn. And he says, even inside of your mother's womb, I know you, I see you. Your substance is not hid from me. Your body and your frame is not hid. You are seen and you are known and you are valued by God. And here's another, the abortion is physical. Not only is it spiritual, not only is it emotional, but it's also physical. I, I, I absolutely believe that a woman should have autonomy over her own body. That's what the argument is painted as today out there. That's what you'll hear over and over again. If you watched the vice presidential debate the other night, they had a segment on abortion, and this is exactly where it goes. The problem, though, with my body, my choice for abortion, is that the body of the child, remember, it is unique. It is genetically unique. It is its own person. That's where they stop in that conversation, it's not that you don't have autonomy over your own body. It's that that child inside of you is its own unique person, created in the image and likeness of God. And it's got value and worth and is separate from the mother. That's why Dr. Lyle, if you ever, that man is awesome. By the way, he's, a, he's actually delivering, uh, should be delivering Joel and Ashton's baby sometime this week. They're due. And he's I delivered thousands upon thousands of babies. He practices, but then he spends like all of his other free time going out and talking about the value of life. Because, and even with, I'll say this too, feel free to follow the science. I'm not as scared of saying that because when you follow the science and you start doing the research and you start genuinely looking at life and all the things that are happening and taking place, you're going to come to the same conclusion that that child is alive, that it is fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator and an intelligent designer. And you know what, um, what Dr. Lyle talks about is that, that a patient is a person no matter how small. If you treat a patient, that patient has rights. And inside the womb, they're able to do open heart surgery. They're able to remove tumors. They're able to do incredible medical procedures. And that's what he's going around promoting. Like, that patient is a person. That is a child. That, that feels pain. That has an entire body. That has an heartbeat at, at uh, 18 days. I mean, we could go on and on. It, Abortion is physical. It's not just eliminating a fetus. It is physically taking a life. Y'all want to hear the rest of that story of that lady that we played at the beginning? As this story plays, I want you to think about just all these different aspects, that the spiritual, the emotional, the physical, all of the different things that we've already talked about this morning. Just watch how it all just kind of plays out through the way the rest of the story plays out. Go ahead. So here's this young lady. She's taking the abortion pill. She is nine weeks pregnant. And she's having profound regrets. She pulls off to the side. She gets out her smartphone and what she Googled was abortion pill antidote. She knew there were antidotes to different things, but she didn't know if there was an antidote to the abortion pill. Well, Google actually took her to our ministry, to our website, which is abortionpillreversal.com. She called the hotline. She spoke with one of the nurses that works at the hotline. She explained the situation. I'm nine weeks pregnant. I just took the abortion pill and I, I know I did the wrong thing. I'm thinking, what did I do? Is there anything that I can do to reverse the effect that's safe for me and safe for the baby? And the nurse says, yes, there is. And she got some information and then she looked and she said, where do you live? And she said, I live in Destin. She goes, well, we have a physician that lives in Pensacola. You just stay on the phone. You start heading home. He's going to give you a call. So I get the call from the hotline, get some of the basic information. I give the patient a call, introduce myself and say, hey, I'm an OBGYN here in Pensacola, Florida. I understand this is the situation. She goes, yes. So we 
asked answered questions. I told her what we could do, told her what the pros and cons were, what the risks and the benefits. And she goes, I want to save the life of my baby. I said, I do too. I said, you just keep on driving. You go to your pharmacy. The nurse just gave me the phone number of your pharmacy. You keep driving. I'm going to pay for your medication. It's going to be waiting for you when you get there. She got to the pharmacy, she picked up the medication. I called her later that night, make sure she had the medication, make sure she had all of her questions answered. And I said, look, it is Friday. I wanna see you in my office in 10 days, a week from Monday. I wanted to see you there at about eight o'clock and we're gonna do an ultrasound. That was the last I heard from her until that following Monday. For 10 days, she was thinking, what's gonna happen at this ultrasound? She's like, I took a medication that I know was meant to kill my baby. She goes, what am I gonna see on this ultrasound? She goes, I know I've taken the medication that they gave me. I know I took it just like they said to take it, but they said it only works about 70% of the time. Did I kill my baby? So she shows up in the office and she is white as a ghost. She is scared. The anxiety that is in her heart and in her mind. So we bring her back for the ultrasound and we introduce ourselves. I introduced myself. We'd only spoken on the phone. We'd never met before. And we have that anxiety. I don't know what we're gonna see. She doesn't know what we're gonna see. We put her up on the table. We start to do the ultrasound and we had a heartbeat. Not only did we have a heartbat, we had a strong, normal heartbeat about 140, 150 times a minute. I said, we've got a heartbeat. Your baby looks beautiful. We're gonna see you back in a week. We saw her back in a week, did another ultrasound and we still had a strong heartbeat. I said, you are out of the danger zone you're gonna have a healthy, beautiful baby. I said, I can't tell you if it's a boy or a girl, but we can do a blood test, and I can tell you if this is a boy or if this is a girl with the blood test. She goes, let's do the blood test. But then she had another decision. What do I tell my boyfriend? She decides, I'm gonna tell him tonight. So she sits him down and she says, look, there's a lot of things I have to go over that have happened in the last 10 days. She goes, uh, number one, I found out I was pregnant and I panicked. She goes, I didn't want to tell you. I didn't know how you would respond. We'd never really talked about this before. She goes, I ended up driving all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, and I was convinced that taking the abortion pill and making this baby go away was the right thing to do. She goes, I took the abortion pill. She goes, I was driving home. I saw a billboard on the right side. I saw a billboard on the left side. She goes, all of a sudden I thought, what have I done? She goes, pulled over, I googled, I found some information on the antidote for the abortion pill. I talked to a nurse, talked to a doctor. They gave me the medication. I took that medication. I went to his office. She goes, I've got a heartbeat on this baby. This baby is fine. She goes, we did another ultrasound a week later. She goes, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I'm going to have this baby. He was thrilled. She didn't know how he was going to be re responding to all this news. He was absolutely excited. Three months later, he proposed to her. Seven months into the pregnancy, she got married to the boyfriend. And then two months after that, I had the honor of delivering this beautiful baby boy. Beautiful baby boy, a baby's life that was saved, a mom that has been redeemed of the guilt of having taken the life of her baby, an ecstatic daddy, and the thing that just touched my heart the most was what did they name the baby? <laughs> What's my name? William. They named the baby William. So there's an old baby William that's beautiful, that's running around now because of the work of somebody who heard the Holy Spirit and put up a billboard. Another person who heard the Holy Spirit. Another person that was working on a hotline and an abortion pill reversal hotline, a gynecologist and a pharmacist, all who work together. That's how the ministry and that's, that's how kingdom service works. We're all a bunch of links that if any one of us had dropped the ball and hadn't done what God had called us to do, we would have had a missing link and we might not have that beautiful baby named William that's alive today. We praise the Lord for the way that that story ended. <clears throat> Man, every time I listen to it, which I've watched it multiple times this week, I, I think about the physical side of it. I think about the profound regret what have I done? I want to save the life of my baby. I, I think about the heartbeat that they saw. I think that they were able to know the sex of that child before it was born. I think about all the anxiety that went into that, that, those 10 days of wondering and then getting the joy and the relief that came from the heartbeat in that. And then I think of the baby and William. And there's a life that is running around and there's a life that is saved because that's exactly what is happening inside of our wombs. And then I also think about the challenge, man. He was doing some good preaching there. We are all a bunch of links 
We are all a bunch of links. There's a lot of physical work that can and must be done. And, and uh, we've got some practical ways that, that we can apply a message like this today. Like down here in the front, we have all of these baby bottles. Anybody been wondering why those are here and what they're there for? All right, we have a local life options clinic right here in Milton. It's about five to 10 minutes away from the church. And guess what? No matter what happens with amendment number four, part of our responsibility as Christians is to, as believers of Jesus, is to promote life. And we need to make it as, as easy as possible for people to be able to have children. For some people, it does place them in what feels like impossible situations. And that's where the body of Christ comes into hand. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. And we need to step out and we need to serve others. We can't just sit on the sidelines and just talk about it and, and yell about it and, and make our, our voice known about it. we got to put our, our faith and our beliefs into action. And an easy way to do that is to help support people that are already doing that. And so these bottles, they're a fundraiser. We're going to ask you at our invitation to come down, take one of these, and you can fill it up with cash. You can fill it up with change. And I want you to take them home, and I want you to bring them back the first Sunday of November, okay? It's the Sunday right before Election Day, so four weeks from today, filled up, and then we're going to give them all back to the Life Options Clinic. We have Christine Kersey. She's a member of our church, and she works at the Life Options Clinic. She's going to be in the back. She can tell you how you can volunteer and how you can help and how you can be a part of something like this. We have, I love the fact that we have a ministry here for foster care and helping to come along and assist even those after that are, that, are, that are born that run into complications. There's all kinds of different ways that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. There's more of these flyers, these things that you got that just, this is not just, man, you watch TV and you watch the news and they like to blow everything way out of proportion. That's not what this is. That video that we watched, it's not just a lot of emotions. It's, it's the reality. If you know anything about law and legal practice, if you don't define and explain, all of this will go to court and exactly what they said hap will happen. And eventually it will be no stopping abortion whatsoever and no parental consent. That just, it blows my mind. Some of the things that, that our world is wanting to get away with, but all I'm saying is this, we are all a bunch of links and we have a part that we can play in it, a physical part that we can play to make a difference in not just protecting life, but also promoting life and preserving life. And the last thing I want to say, and we are just about done, is this. Life is ordained. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. You know what he's saying in this verse? Before I had shape or form, okay, before I was even made, before, that, before the moment of conception even happened, God knew what I was going to be. And all of my days were written in your book before even one of them came to be. Can I tell you that life is ordained by God. Before you were born, God created you. You're not only fearfully and wonderfully made, but he's given you a purpose to fulfill that nobody else can. You are genetically unique. I am genetically unique from every other human being on the face of this earth. And I have been preordained by God and given a purpose of something that he wants me to accomplish that is different from something that he wants you to accomplish. Our lives were established and appointed by God, and he has a good plan, and he has a good purpose for every single person that's here. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that God's got good plans and purposes for us? How many of you believe that sometimes we can mess those good plans and purposes up? <laughs> Have you ever messed up any of God's good plans in your life? We all can say a big, loud, resounding amen to that right there. We have all done that. But you know what he did? He went to a cross, and he died so that we could be forgiven. I want to go back to just Genesis and that whole picture of the fact that we're created in the image of God. He breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and what did we do with it? We rebelled, and we rejected God, and we messed up. And then what did he do? He says, I'm not done with you. You were created with care and purpose and intentionality. I saw your members. I saw your form and your structure inside of your mother's womb. I've got a plan for you, and I love you, and I care about you. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to become a man, and I'm going to enter into your world, and I'm going to live a sinless life, and I'm going to go to a cross because the punishment for sin was death. And on that cross, I'm going to die so that you can have a relationship with me, so that those plans that you've messed up and those purposes that you've clouded and that you've ruined, they can all be redeemed and they can all be restored because of the blood of Jesus Christ and because of what he did for us on the cross. And the last thing I want us to understand this morning, abortion, just like any other sin, just like any other wrongdoing, is forgivable. 
You know what's beautiful about the gospel? The gospel treats the spiritual, the emotional, and the physical. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing that we can ever do that can ever remove us and separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every single sin, anything that happens and takes place, it can be forgiven and it can be covered by the grace and mercy of our loving God and our loving Savior. Abortion is forgivable. And I want to play this last video and then we are done. The Bible, abortion, and forgiveness. What does the Bible say to the person who has been a part of this wrong decision? Well, the Bible shows us the path forward to what is right. It also teaches us that we aren't perfect, that not only are we born in sin, but that we all have chosen the wrong path. Romans 3.23 teaches us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Despite our sin, God sent his son Jesus to die for our sin and rise again conquering our sin. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What is beautiful is the next verse. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned. God loves you and wants you to be saved. The Bible is a book filled with the truth of God's mercy in the midst of our wrongdoing, his grace in the place of our sinfulness, and his son taking the wrath that we deserve. The unequivocal message of the Bible is that no matter what you and I have done, how far we have gone, God is waiting for you with open arms to receive his forgiveness and compassion. Uh, God is so good to give us a template for when we make mistakes. And so he says, if you cover your sin, you're not going to prosper. But when you confess your sin, hey, grace meets you there. So if this has been a mistake in, in a woman's life, God says, you confess that, you get that right. I cover it with my blood, I cover it with my grace. And then he says, I'm gonna cast it as far as the east, is from the west, and you don't have to live in it. His grace is there every single day covering that. You don't have to live with the guilt. You don't have to live with the shame. Satan wants you to live there and God says, no, I've taken care of it. We have all said things that we regret. We have all done things that we regret. That's just part of our human life. But there's an amazing thing is that all of those things that we regret saying and doing can be forgiven. When we look at Romans 5, 8, God loved us so much that he sent his son, he gave his life for all sinners. And that doesn't just mean for certain sins, that means all sins. Is abortion a sin? Absolutely but the blood of Jesus can cover the sin of abortion. Women who have had an abortion and men who've been involved in an abortion, that sin can be covered and it can be forgiven. And there is healing available to both men and women. Some of the most effective counselors at our pregnancy resource centers are men and women who have been through abortion. They understand that fear. They understand that anxiety. They understand that loneliness. They know exactly what that young lady and what that young man are going, for, going through. And it is important that they use that past to serve Jesus' kingdom now, to defend God's preborn, and also share the healing message of forgiveness to all of them. Let's all stand to our feet. I'm not going to bow our heads and close our eyes, but the invitation is simple. I want you to do two things today, okay? In a minute, when I, I'm going to pray, and then when I'm done, I want you to come down here, and I want you to grab one of these bottles. All right, and then what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take it back to your seat, and with your family, I'd like you to spend just a few minutes praying for two things. One, that God would stop Amendment 4 from passing, that he would just intervene. Right now, it's going to take a miracle of God. I think there's 69% of support in favor of that bill passing. It only needs 60% to pass. So it's going to take a miracle of God. But I was reminded on Wednesday night going through Psalm chapter 20 that God doesn't want us to trust in our chariots and our horses and our human strength and our intellect and what, what we have that makes sense. He wants us to trust in the name of the Lord our God who's able to move and who's able to work. And you know what he wants his people to do? To get on our faces before him and to cry out to him in prayer and to pray with faith believing that he can intervene. So let's do that this morning. Let's pray.
And then I also want you, while you're praying, that, that God would stop that amendment from passing, that, that he would use us as individuals and us as a church to promote life, to promote the value of life. We are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. We were created with care and purpose and intentionality. He sees us. He loves us. And our world needs to know who he is. And he need, need to know how valuable and how loved they are and how he can forgive and how he can redeem and how he can restore when the light of the gospel gets turned on in their lives and how everything gets turned upside down for God's honor and for God's good and for his glory.